All right. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Morris. I'm a rheumatologist in Kingsport, Tennessee. And I'm going to be talking about a disease that is extremely common. And to be very honest with you, as a rheumatologist, we see a lot of patients who are not particularly well managed with this disease. It's one that everyone should know how, every primary care person should know how to be able to manage. And I think that's an important thing. So our discussion is going to be on uh, a longstanding disease known as gout. First of all, I do not have any financial disclosures related to this presentation. Um, gout is an old disease, um, and it's probably one of the worst that one can have in terms of arthritic disease. Uh, this uh, description written by the Reverend Sidney Smith in the uh, 19th century gives you a good idea on how bad it is. Uh, it's one that has a ton of history. Uh, there have been many cartoons drawn, and this one here is a real good example of a depiction of gout. It basically is called the rich man's disease, and you can see it usually shows a person who is rather portly, who is eating wonderful food and drinking wonderful beverages, and he's being tormented by a little devil uh, that's causing the uh, attack in the foot known as gout. Give you a little bit of historical perspective. Believe it or not, there was actually data talking about this disease by the ancient Egyptians and Greeks. It was one of the first diseases that we really actually identified as a disease. In 1679, Leeuwenhoek, who with his brand new microscope, actually identified crystals coming from a tophus. He was not able to tell what it was that was coming out of it, but he did see the crystals. In 1797, Wollaston was the first one who identified uric acid as coming from the gouty tophus. And I think this is the first step toward linking uh, an elevated uric acid level and the development of gout. Um, going on in 1854, Alfred uh, Gerard first demonstrated that uric crystals trigger an inflammatory response in the gout inflammation, and he also helped to separate gout from rheumatoid arthritis, showing that there were two different diseases. And it's important that uh, he noted that deposited urate of soda may be looked upon as the cause, not just an effect of gouty inflammation. And so this is one where they really uh, follow Cook's postulate and showed that uh, the elevated uric acid and the uric acid crystals were what were triggering the gout attack. Dan McCarty, who uh, was chief of rheumatology up at the University of Wisconsin, he did some rather unusual um, research on this. And what he did was he took a trainee and himself and they purified uh, monosodium urate crystals and had them injected into one knee and put plain saline in the other knee. And both of them developed excruciating pain and swelling in the knee that had the crystals. So this was sort of um, the proof positive that uh, gout crystals can trigger uh, the acute inflammatory reaction. Um, similar studies have been done on dogs, and they also had identical results. So let's talk about what is gout. Gout is the most common inflammatory arthritic disease. It is far by two or three fold uh, out um, levels that of um, rheumatoid arthritis. While we always talk about the acute attack, it is actually an in chronic inflammatory arthritis. Deposition of monosodium urate crystals in the tissues ends up causing uh, the in chronic inflammatory response highlighted by acute uh, attacks in the foot and other joints. Over years, the patient will first have maybe an occasional attack, but the frequency starts to become uh, more common. The number of attacks and the number of sites that become more common, and it, it can eventually end up being a chronic inflammatory arthritis, multiple joints involved. It can cause damage to the joints, loss of limb function, and a lot of pain. We're going to look at all of these over the, um, the next uh, little bit. In terms of frequency, there are nine and a half million Americans with gout, and this is growing, unfortunately. Uh, contrast that about two to three million Americans have rheumatoid arthritis. There are multiple comorbidities that go along with it. It is not just a disease of the joints. We can get actually deposition throughout the whole body. Uncontrolled gout is when there is chronic uh, gout attacks that do not respond to the conventional therapies. While nine and a half million Americans have gout, 
less than 200,000 have controlled gout. That should give you an idea that that means we're really doing a bad job when 90% of the patients with gout aren't really treated appropriately and uh, controlled well. Oh, there. In terms of cost to society, uh, when someone has gout, they have an average of five days, sick days a year. Um, the number of days of short-term disability is twice that of uh, other diseases. In terms of cost to the employer, you're losing a lot of money if you're an employer and has a gout patient. Uh, primary care visits per year uh, is about 50% uh, higher in patients with gout. Hospital admission rates are higher. And the cost to the, uh, to the individual itself was $1,700 more than those without gout. It is much higher if the serum uric acid level is higher than nine. And those are the people that are going to have the more um, severe and more frequent gout attacks. Basically, what does cause gout? Gout is the attack itself, and it's caused by elevation of the concentration of uric acid beyond the solubility threshold, which is 6.8, which results in the deposition of crystals in the tissues. That's what triggers the gout attack. Uric acid levels can sort of exist silently for a long time. And so while patients may have an hyperuricemia, not everybody with hyperuricemia is going to develop gout. However, the longer you have a high uric acid level and the higher the uric acid level, the more likely you are to develop a, a gout attack. Um, why do we get it? That's the big question a lot of people have. Well, I, I mentioned that uric acid uh, maximum solubility is about 6.8. The problem we have is number one, humans don't have uric acid oxidase or uricase. This is the uh, what will break down uric acid into far more dissolvable chemicals such as allantoic acid. Uric acid, therefore, is the end uh, product of purine metabolism. Humans, some birds, and some dinosaurs are the creatures that do not have a uh, uricase to break down the uric acid. Uric acid is also poorly solvable, soluble. Only 6.8 is the maximum solubility. That's at 98.6 degrees. You drop the temperature like in cold feet down to 6.0 uh, or down to say 94, 95 degrees, you'll find that the uric acid maximum solubility is only about 6.0. One other thing is we sort of do it to ourselves. Uh, while our, ur our kidneys are doing a good job of, um, of excreting uh, uric acid, 90% of it gets reabsorbed. And so it doesn't do a good job of getting rid of it and keeping it gone. Um, these are the stages of gout. We're going to come back to this, but I wanted to go over a little bit at the beginning. And it's important to recognize that it is not just a yes or no, do you have gout? First, there's the asymptomatic hyperuricemia. Started, then you start to have acute flares. There's an area between flares, and that's called the intercritical period. And then there's advanced gout, and uh, that's the one that causes all the big problems when it if if it continues uh, on. Um, in terms, of, we're going to come back to these stages and go over them a little bit later. Um, causes of uncontrolled gout. First of all, genetics plays a big role. We know that if somebody has um, certain, a family member with gout, they are far more likely to develop gout. Renal function is a big factor, also. Now. In my cartoon earlier, I pointed out that there was a gentleman eating, you know, rich diet, you know, rich diet and lots of food and wine and everything else. While we know the high purine diet does play a role, it only getting rid of every single solitary thing would only result in about a one milligram per deciliter reduction in the uric acid. So diet can play a role, but it's not as big as we like to think. Um, in terms of risks of developing gout, the first one has to be the uric acid level in the blood. We'll have a lot of patients who are told that they have gout because they have a uric acid of 8.1. The truth is gout is not met, diagnosed by a blood test. We use the blood test, though, to identify those patients who are more likely to develop gout. Um, in this, this uh, paper that was that's uh, demonstrated here, in people that had a serum uric acid level of greater than 10, they had about 50% chance of developing gout in the next 10, 15 years. 
When someone has the first flare and their uric acid is greater than nine, they have about an 85% chance of having another gout attack. And in people who are untreated, they will develop tophaceous gout if they're around uh, for 20 years. And so you can see that it takes a lot of um, effort and it's a prolonged elevation of the serum uric acid. Now, um, uric acid deposition, it doesn't just occur at the joints. It can be at any part of the body. And so um, it's important that when you have a load at the joint, if it's loading up the joint, it's also loading up the soft tissues and what, as well, which really makes it very difficult to uh, manage you know, the high uric acid levels unless we're a little bit aggressive with it. Now, obviously, everybody knows about the uh, attacks at the bottom of the foot down here. But the problem we have is that it isn't just in there. When it is advanced gout, we can see attacks occurring in the Achilles tendon, in the knee, the finger pads, the wrists, even the helix of the ear. And these are all areas, if you think about it, they're colder parts on our body. And so that's why it seems to deposit there a lot more. Um, here are some studies that have been done, and uh, you can see these are uh, case reports of where uh, uric acid has, or uric acid deposition has been found. Um, back when I was a fellow, uh, the University of Florida, they were able to identify uh, uric acid deposition within the spinal canal of a VA patient, and they were actually showed with aggressive treatment that they could measure the shrinkage of that uh, of that uh, tophus. And so that's you know, using MRI again. I don't advocate using MRI for that, but it was a nice study that was able to be done by a colleague of mine. Um, hyperuricemia itself, I want to separate gout from hyperuricemia. I think that's an important thing to do. First of all, hyperuricemia is what triggers the gout, but not everybody with hyperuricemia has gout. The association of hyperuricemia with other diseases, though, is rather uh, important. First of all, patients who are obese are more likely to have hyperuricemia. Very high percentage of patients with metabolic syndrome and diabetes. Heart failure is linked to hyperuricemia, hypertension is, and hyperlipidemia. For a long time, we had originally thought that these were just sort of coincidental, but there's some data that actually suggests there may be a little bit more of a link. There we are. Um, we know that um, elevated uric acid is an independent risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, stroke, and heart failure. Um, chronic uh, kidney disease, unfortunately, the uh, gout, as the uric acid starts to deposit in the kidneys, it can have nephrotoxicity. We also know that patients with gout and hyperuricemia have an increased um, risk of death over, the over a 10-year period. Serum uric acid may actually promote ischemic heart disease, and that's a big problem. Hyperuricemia, as you can see, can uh, cause smooth cell proliferation, free, free radical production, increased platelet adhesion and aggregation. And so it's, if this, it may be a lot more active in the development of heart disease. It may not be just sort of going along coincidentally. Cardiovascular risk. Uh, this was a study that appeared last August. And what it was interesting is they had 62,000 patients with gout diagnosis, and they were evaluated for cardiovascular events after a gout flare. And what they saw was that there was a 90% increased likelihood of a gout attack in the two months prior to a cardiovascular event. And there was a 50% increased risk of an attack um, uh, basically within the six months before. And so what it there certainly raised the question of could gout be a uh, contributor to the development of cardiovascular events? We also know that cardiovascular mortality is associated with a higher level of uh, uric acid. This study that was done back in 2004 divided men into three groups according to their serum urate levels. They noted that the ones who had the lowest uric acid levels had a uh, much higher uh, cardiac cumulative survival than those who had high uric acid levels. And, uh, and so I think this is an important thing. We don't know exactly how it works. We don't know exactly what it's doing, but it seems that a high uric acid level is associated with increased cardiovascular disease and mortality. 
Metabolic syndrome is something that we see an awful lot, and it's unfortunately a, a combination of hyperuricemia, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. And it was seen that 25% of the patients with metabolic syndrome might have gout, and that a very high percentage of patients with gout actually fit into the uh, metabolic syndrome um, uh, realm. Uh, creatinine and kidney function is also uh, affected by serum uric acid levels. And this study that came in uh, out of Japan actually demonstrated that serum uric acid levels were the most significant correlate for developing an elevated serum creatinine level. So in other words, let's take a look at this. And this is a rather busy slide, but if you'll notice, um, it basically points out that uric acid levels, um, where you get the turnover from xanthine into uric acid by uricase, then you normally it will go over to allantoic acid in other creatures, but we don't have that uricase to do that. Um, xanthine oxidase is what breaks down xanthine into uric acid. There are excre excretory mechanisms, mostly out of the uric kidney. Hyperuricosuria in, results in uh, crystals in the tissues of the kidney, and that can cause kidney stones and kidney damage. There are some cardiovascular disease and also the high uric acid. So the biggest thing is the uric acid is contributing to a lot of different diseases in our older patients. Now, the pathophysiology of gout, as I mentioned, um, above 6.8 uric acid will start to precipitate as monosodium urate crystals. These crystals that go into tissues that are colder because of the fact that the uric acid, um, the, the, since the temperature is a little lower, it's more likely to develop uh, crystals in those tissues. And it is those crystals, they're microscopic, they're the size of a bacteria, and those are what can trigger the uh, gout flare and the development of a tophus. These are again risk factors and comorbidities, and you can see these are things we look for, and those are that are. Uh, associated with the development of gout, cardiovascular disease and kidney disease, whether this is sort of an egg and the chicken question, did the egg um, come first or the chicken come first? And the answer is one of them did, and maybe both of them working simultaneously. Certain medications are definitely shown to increase uric acid levels. Thiazide diuretics are by far the most commonly used. Uh, Low-dose aspirin, it's interesting, high-dose aspirin is actually got uric uh, activity, but in the low dose aspirin that we use for our heart patients, that unfortunately increases uric acid levels. Um, levodopa and nicotinic acid are two other medicines that do that. We see it more in male than in women. Women generally do not develop hyperuricemia and gout until after they go through menopause. So they have about a 10 to 20, you know, men have about a 10 to 20 year head start on women. In terms of lifestyle, high BMI, rich diet in seafood, particularly the shellfish, high, uh, you, high consumption of high fructose corn syrup. So if somebody's a uh, Coca-Cola fiend, unfortunately, they're the ones that are more likely to develop, to develop a gout. High alcohol intake, particularly beer. Beer seems to be more of a problem in terms of alcohol. Again, going back to our original talk, stages of gout, we start off first with this uh, asymptomatic hyperuricemia. And this is where a lot of people are. It does not mean they're going to go on to this next one, but it's important to identify patients so that maybe there can be some mild things done, not necessarily treatments. High uh, acute a gouty attack, that's the um, pain that we have. It's um, severe. It is excruciatingly bad. And it is triggered by um, MSU crystals that are uh, taken in by the uh, inflammatory cells. Intercritical periods, this is the time in which the patient is asymptomatic. That's important in, our term, in terms of evaluating someone with hyperuricemia because that's when the uric acid level is the most accurate. Over time, we'll see more and more uh, acute gouty attacks with intercritical periods. The intercritical periods become less and less frequent, they become shorter in terms of duration. Then we start to see two or three attacks, we see in other places. And finally, we get to this level of a, a advanced gout in which there is polyarticular destructive arthropathy. Uh, why do the MSU crystals get deposited in the tissues? They're poorly soluble, they're uh, colder areas. 
when there's reabsorption of water, like when you use a uh, diuretic, that leads to acute tissue supersaturation and trauma can also predispose. Um, go, let's go through each of the stages and go over and really go over some of these things and see what we can, um, where we can look at. First of all, hyperuricemia. We do not need to treat hyperuricemia <clears throat> in many patients. So somebody who comes in with uh, a uric acid of 8, 8.5, I would not start treating them unless they've had gout attacks. The acute gouty attack. This is what everybody knows. This is an intensely painful joint inflammation. The patients have some catchwords. If you hear someone come in with foot pain, they will say the sheet hurts to touch it. That line is so um, almost, it's almost a diagnostic test for gout. They often start at night and they will last anywhere from three days up to a full week. The, user, the, the first attacks are monoarticular, and the vast majority are at the first uh, MTP. That's our classic pedagra. Other places that are very common as a first attack would be the ankle, maybe a uh, finger or a thumb. Um, the thing is, during a gout attack, the uric acid levels may be normal. And that's a bit of a throw-off because we'll have a patient who'll come, have come in and they've had this horribly intense attack in the foot, but they'll have gotten a uh, blood work done and they'll say, oh, my uric acid was normal, so it can't be gout. During the uric acid, during the attack, what happens is urinary uric excretion goes up and so it may be falsely lowered. This is what it looks like. You can see this patient's foot here. It is so intense, it's on a pillow. They don't want anybody to come near it. Um, and it can really get bad within a very short period of time. When someone has an attack, it's usually monoarticular. The second attack in, in, can occur in about, with about 60% of patients within a year. Other things you can have symptomatically, you can have uh, low-grade fevers, chills, malaise, elevated sed rate, and uh, elevated white can uh, also occur. And as I mentioned up here, the initial attack in men is usually between the fourth and fifth uh, decades. Women, the onset is a little bit later because of um, it doesn't usually hit until after menopause. In terms of the common side of acute flares, 90% of, of patients will eventually have an attack in the foot. Uh, that's by far the most common. And you can see here a lot of different areas that can have attacks. Um, the acute flares can become recurrent as gout progresses. You can see in this photograph here, there's a picture of the classic pedagra at the uh, first MTP, but this patient's lucky enough to have two joints involved in that his ankle is also intensely uh, inflamed. The practical diagnosis of gout. Um, the gold standard is to find a uh, synovial fluid, uh, the monosodium urate crystals in the synovial fluid. We also like to see the crystals being intracellular. Now, I'm the first one in the world to tell you most patients who have gout do not particularly like having somebody come near their uh, inflamed toe with a needle. And so it may be hard to get synovial fluid analysis during a, uh, an acute attack. But if it's not available and the patient's history and um, the findings, then you can somewhat make a presumptive diagnosis. The best time to maybe tell is after an attack, you can go and check the uric acid. If it's way up, then you can say, okay, that it was a gout attack. And so things that we know we go over when we're talking about it, looking at a good history, we look for risk factors, comorbidities, family history. If, mom, if Uncle George had gout, guess what? That's a good sign that it could be gout. Physical examination, uh, you look to see if they have TOFI. There are some patients who develop TOFI before they ever have an attack. But you want to you look for the erythematous, swollen, and very, very tender joint. And so those are all parts of the assessment. Um, it's important to realize gout can look like a lot of other diseases. Um, Bob Turkletaub out in San Diego is one of the top experts on gout. And he's made the statement uh, that you haven't been in practice long enough until you've missed the diagnosis of gout. And so it can really be a lookalike to a lot of different diseases. It can look like rheumatoid arthritis, aseptic arthritis. I've seen a patient, we unfortunately, there was a patient in our area who ended up having his foot removed because of what they thought was septic arthritis, only to find out it was tophaceous gout. 
the way we make the diagnosis, this is your typical uh, microscope. We have a polarizing uh, lens down here and that causes the light to be polarized. And the second part of it is this red compensator that helps with the um, bending the light a certain way. Here's a picture of some gout crystals and these are uh, monosodium urate. The top one here is a uh, just no ordinary polarized like, uh, light microscopy. And you can see here, they sort of uh, glow. They're very bright. It's very a pretty picture, not with the patient. Once you add that red um, filter in there, then it, we start to get the classic um, divergence in which we see yellow when, it is, when the uh, crystal is parallel to the uh, polarizing filter, and it becomes blue when it is perpendicular to the polarizing filter. That's what the birefringence means, yellow parallel to the filter. That's the way you can think of it. Um, intercritical periods. This is the time between the gout attack. And they're still in there. The crystals are still in there. And actually, even though the, we don't see a lot of really rip-roaring hot pain, there is chronic low-grade inflammation. So what this is, is this is an acute, severe inflammation with periods of, uh, in, you know, interspersed between time of chronic low-grade inflammation. And it's, the longer the crystals are there, the more likely it is to cause recurrent attacks, and it's the more likely it is to develop TOFI. In terms of prolonged treat, untreated hyperuricemia and gout, we see the occur attacks occurring with increased frequency. We start to see multiple joints being attacked at the same time. We can actually end up seeing a chronic persistent inflammatory arthritis that looks just like rheumatoid arthritis, except for some very differences. With time, we can even see development, with time, we can even see development of erosive arthritic changes. And then finally, we start to see the TOFI develop. I'm going to go back and repeat this one since I was chewing ice. Um, with prolonged untreated hyperuricemia and gout, we'll see an increase in the frequency of the attacks. We can start to see polyarticular gout attacks. We can see uh, a chronic inflammatory arthritis, what looks like any other inflammatory arthritic disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis. It can actually be a lookalike to rheumatoid arthritis. Erosive changes start to develop, and we can start to see TOFI. We're going to look at all these right now. Here is a patient with tophaceous gout, and you can see they have rather significant deposition of the monosodium urate crystals in big chunks on the, on the hands. It can occur in the, you know, the DIPs. You notice this finger actually looks a little shortened. It's probably because the tophus has eaten away the bone in that joint. Here's another uh, tophus. A lot of times we'll see this little eschar on the outside. And if you scratch it, uh, white stuff comes out of it. It looks sort of like, sort of like pepsin and toothpaste. And if you put it under a microscope, you start to see these big collections of the monosodium urate crystals. And in this one, again, you can see there's a nice yellow uh, crystal, and then one that's perpendicular to it is blue. And that's part of the um, divirefringence of this. So if you see something like this, an easy way to confirm the diagnosis that this is a tophus is to see if uh, the uh, white uh, tophaceous material comes out that's got the crystals in it. Here's another real common place to find gouty tophi, and that's in the elbow. One of the nice things about this is if you see a fluid collection in a patient you're suspicious of gout with, you can stick a needle in there uh, using a septic technique and then take the fluid and look and have them do a crystal examination. You'll find a ton of crystals. Often you'll find intracellular crystals, which are ones that have been taken up by the white cells. Those That's really a very confir uh, good confirmation confirmatory test for gout. Um, when you do patients that are going to develop TOFI, first of all, prolonged hyperuricemia, and it is extremely elevated. Usually, a patient doesn't develop TOFI unless their uric acid is staying persistently above 10 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, they also have free to, uh, frequent gouty attacks, which shows that they're having a lot of problems, and it's a prolonged period of untreated gout. The longer we don't treat the uric acid or under-treat the uric acid, the more likely they are to develop um, gap, uh, TOFI. Now, here's a picture of a patient who has chronic gouty arthritis. And what you'll notice up here in the DIPs is there are erosions in here. These are actually TOFI that have eaten into the bone. 
Um, you can see here the MCP joints down here and the carpels look pretty good. So that helps to exclude that these crystals are, or that this is a uh, erosive disease like rheumatoid arthritis. It's more distal, you can see, and that's another important uh, part of it. Here's a little better picture, and you see this little overhang here in the bone, and this is actually a tophus. One of the things interesting, you see these crystals and you see the tophi, and they look like they're white, thick chalk stuff, but they're pretty radiolucent, and that's one of the things here. You don't really see the crystal, you know, you don't see the tophus here. It's just a little bit of a shadow. But this very sharp demarcation with the hang, the edges heading over, that's a real common finding for um, a uh, tophaceous gout uh, erosion. Again, down here, there's another one you can see here, and it actually gets into the bone, and it causes permanent damage to the joint. So let's talk about how are we going to treat gout. I think that there's three different ways to look at it. First of all, we want to stop the acute attack. This is an important component because patients, we they're suffering and, and we want to keep that from happening and we want to prevent that. Or even better, we want to try and stop the attack when it starts. Second of all, we want to try and protect against recurrent attacks. And then thirdly, we try to address the hyperuricemia. And so let's look at each one of these right now. Um, okay. Again, this is just a little bit more information talking about it, where what we're doing is we resolve the acute flare we then start the urate therapy, and then we want to maintain the urate uh, levels really low. And that's an important thing. It's important to recognize treating the gout attack is not the same as treating the hyperuricemia. They are separate approaches. Um, the aim of a gout attack treatment is not to basically cure the gout. What we're trying to do is get the acute inflammatory process under control. The medication choice must be delivered because each of the medicines we have, unfortunately, have a lot of side effects, and you have to take in the patient's comorbidities when you're starting to make a decision on which medicine to use. It's important to recognize medicines such as NSAIDs, colchicine, etc. They have no effect on the uric acid levels. That's something we'll talk about later. Um, these are the medicines that are currently uh, have been shown to have effect in uh, gout attacks. The first one in the NSAIDs, I think those um, all do a good job. They all um, are, they've all been shown to be effective. And uh, so I don't think there's one that does better. I will, let me rephrase that. Uh, there are some that do better than others. The ones that have the most potent uh, effects, such as indomethacin, naproxen, Celecoxib, those have been approved for gout, and they've been shown to help with gout attacks. Some of the milder ones, such as nebumatone, I really don't try to use because it's just not that effective. Colchicine, this has been around for centuries, literally centuries. It is useful if you use early. It can actually be used in the prodromus, so somebody's starting to feel like they're having an attack, that's when they can start to be the medication as well. It can be used with other medications. Now, there's a little history behind it. In the past, many people my age were told you give it to a patient every hour on the hour until they either, either get abdominal pain, diarrhea, or the gout attack is under control. The only patient I would ever give that kind of recommendation to is somebody I really, truly hate. Um, there was a study done about seven or eight years ago where they compared that classic um, treatment modality with taking two pills of the uric of the colchicine followed by a third dose 12 hours later and see how it does. They actually saw that these two modalities worked the same, but that the patients tolerated the three pills much, much better than the patients who took them once an hour. Corticosteroids, I'll tell you a secret. This is something if you ask most rheumatologists, we begrudgingly admit that this is what we are going to use if somebody has a gout attack. Uh, I have patients, that, you know, since I'm in Kingsport, Tennessee, we have patients that uh, work internationally and have gout. They're spending six to eight to 12 hours on a jet tra traveling to China or at Germany or other parts of the country, of the world, I mean, and they have, might to have, start to have a gout attack. They'll carry with them some prednisone. If they feel the uh, attack starting to come on, they'll take it very quickly and it gets it under control. Several other agents have been used, uh, interleukin-1 agents, which include um, uh, canakinumab, 
And uh, there's another one that's a once a day dosing. And both of those are good medicines. They do help with the gout attacks. Unfortunately, they are expensive as all get out. They also are not FDA approved. We all sort of hope that Kinerep does get it, which is the once a day drug. It'd be nice if we could have a patient, you know, who has gout, just take a single dose of uh, Anakinra and see a recovery of their uh, tap. Uh, ACTH gel, when I was a fellow, that was what one of the things we would give if a patient had a heart attack and was having a gout attack in the ICU, we would give them a dose of ACTH gel. At that time, it ran about $50. Since some actions due to the F, uh, by the FDA, ACTH gel has been rebranded and now runs about, say, uh, 18000 bucks a month. And so that's one it's nice to know about, but it's not one that we're going to use with any regularity. Side effects of the agents. I think this is an important component, and this has to be taken into account when you start to choose which medicine you're going to use. Obviously, when we talk about the fact that patients with uh, gout are much more likely to have uh, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, and renal problems, NSAIDs may not be the best choice. And so I think you have to weigh this, uh, these risks when you talk about giving it to a patient with underlying comorbidities. Colchicine is a good drug, but a lot of patients have stomach troubles with it, renal problems if you take too much of it. Bone marrow effects can be occurring. I think this is probably why most rheumatologists feel the least bad choice for a gout attack is a corticosteroids. They have a short-term effect, they, um, and they can have some effects on some patients, but I think in general, we feel they probably have the least uh, bad problems in a lot of patients who have gout. In 2020, the American College of Rheumatology came up with guidelines for the treatment of gout, and I think these are sort of... Um, important to look at because they do give us an idea on where we go. First of all, initiating uh, treatment. We, if the only time, when would we, these are mostly talking about treating hyperuricemia. When do we start treatment? If there's evidence of an erosion, if there's presence of gouty tophus, or if they've had two or more gout flares. And I think that's um, an important point. We don't, in someone who's had a heart attack and has been diuresed like crazy, their first and only gout attack, we may not start giving them uh, urate lowering therapy. If, however, there are patients who have uh, kidney disease, urolithiasis, or a uric acid greater than nine, we're a lot more likely to start them on some urate lowering therapy. Um, asymptomatic hyperuricemia in someone who has never had a gout attack, we do not consider treating. And I think the only person I would ever consider starting someone, uh, someone for treatment is someone if their uric acid was 11, 12, or 13. And the reason being, they may not have had gout attacks, but my gut feeling is at that kind of a level, it's only a matter of time before they do. Once the treatment is started uh, for lowering the uric acid, the treatment should be indefinite and lifelong. Now, this is a bit of a change. It used to be we would never, ever start uric acid treatments during a gout attack. And I've, I'm still a little skeptical on this one. I've seen patients who have started the uh, allopurinol during a gout attack, and lo and behold, it made their uh, attack worse. And so they, they wouldn't even touch the stuff later on saying it causes gout attack. We have to treat this disease um, the same way we treat hyperuricemia, high cholesterol. We need to have a treat-to-target idea. Our goal is to get the uric acid level down below six for most patients and even lower um, if they have other things such as tophaceous gout or uric acid stones. This also warrants monitoring. You can't just start a patient on allopurinol and say, go on your merry way. We and not follow up on the uric acid levels. It is important to keep a watch on these. Uh, when do we treat? Um, again, this is talking about that. This is just a repeat. If someone's had multiple gouty attacks, they're the ones that need to be on urate lowering therapy. No doubt in my mind. We know that when the uric, that the level of the uric acid in the blood of a gout patient has a direct correlation how, on how often they have an attack. This is a, a nice slide that shows basically what happens. If you have a patient who has had a gout attack and their uric acid is below six, they have a less than 20% chance of another gout attack within a year. 
Contrast that in someone who has a, a gout attack and their uric acid is greater than nine in the intercritical period, they have about an 85 to 90% chance of another gout attack within a year. And so while the gout attacks, um, you know, the way to keep the gout attacks uh, from occurring is to reduce that serum uric acid level um, and be aggressive with it. Now, this is a sort of an interesting slide. This uh, shows what happens as, and we know that once the uric acid reaches 6 to 6.8, we start to see progression of the disease. The crystals get unchanged. We start to see more and more um, uh, uric acid deposition as it goes up. And these are the ones that are going to have more problems. Uh, the, and the other thing to keep in mind, again, is that subclinical inflammation may be present even when there's no attacks. The risk of gout attack, again, this is one that shows what we're talking about in terms of uh, patients with a uric acid level, and that's why we try and get it as low as we can. Now, I've asked, somebody have asked me, you know, can you really tell that getting the uric acid levels makes a difference? And this is a great example uh, in answer to that. This is uh, before treatment, and this is what happens is a patient who had uric acid in the excess of nine and had the tophaceous gout, and you can see the damage, the destruction, everything going on. This is what happens one year of uric acid levels under four. And you can see that the uh, tophi have re reduced in size significantly. You see that the, you know, look at this one on the right third uh, PIP, and it basically has gone back to normal. We can't undo damage that's already occurred. And that's one problem. You can see that through this digit here. But you can see there's a whole heck of a lot of normalcy to the, the hand with uh, aggressive uric acid lowering therapy. And so this, is, this really gives us a good idea on why we want to do what we have. I actually have patients who we have gotten their uric acid levels really, really low and have seen the TOFI literally melt away over a three to six month period. It's very impressive when it happens. Um, in terms of urate lowering therapies, we have a number of them available, Probenicid, we have uh, the Sinurad, which is one that became available in the United States, but it has become a lot less available, unfortunately. Allopurinol, Fabuxostat, and Peglodicase. We're gonna look at a, li a little bit on uh, each one of these. In terms of treatment, the preferred initial treatment is allopurinol. You'll notice something. Don't start at 300 a day. You start down at way down at 100 a day and you titrate the dose up slowly. Um, the urate lowering, that are, the ones that block uric acid production are, pre are preferred over uh, probenicid in patients who have kidney disease. You need a functioning kidney for uh, probenicid to work. The probenicid is not an option in, say, patients who have nephrolysiasis. Peglodicase, that's another one we're going to talk about because it's a great uh, addition to our armamentarium, but it's not one that we use um, at first in most patients. Um, we first, again, this is one thing about these uh, medicines, start low, work your way up. One of the things sort of interesting is that we've got a little bit higher level than most patients, uh, most doctors are aware of when we talk about allopurinol treatment. We, when I was going through, we never went above 300. Now we can push it up to literally uh, 800 milligrams a day. If there is, if there is um, cardiovascular disease, you may be wanting to stay on allopurinol compared to febuxostat. If there is a lot of renal problems, you might go more with febuxostat. Uh, allopurinol is the first treatment. It's dirt cheap. It really does a great job. 90% of patients with gout can tolerate it, and it does quite well. It is the treatment of choice in anybody who's had nephrolithiasis, can take them once a day. There is a risk of um, toxic epidermal necrolysis, which is a form of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. We now know that this is something that occurs in maybe four, two to three cases per million per year. There is a certain HLA-B antigen that is associated with this. And if you look at the patients who are Southeastern Asian or of African-American origin, it may be worth checking the patient for the HLA-B5801 marker, because those are the ones that are more likely to develop the skin problems. If you have a patient who is on azathioprine for, say, Crohn's disease or for renal transplant or something like that, Allopurinol should be you know, given with some caution. Um, 
this is a little bit of a difference. We used to talk about uh, uric acid or a uh, creatinine clearance of 50 being a problem in patients with allopurinol. We're actually saying you could probably use it in patients with a uric uh, with a creatinine clearance in the 30, upper 30s, 40s, maybe 45. So Buxostat, this is a newer medicine. Um, this is a, all right. Fibuxostat, this is a newer medication. It also works in the same area of the uh, xanthine oxidase and the hypoxanthine oxidase. It's different part of the trough um, in the enzyme. It is a very impressive medication. It works very well. Uh, the one thing that's nice is it can be used in patients with renal failure because it is a hepatically uh, excreted molecule. Um, you might watch out with the liver. That's the one thing we say you ought to do. The starting dose is um, 40 milligrams a day. After six weeks, you have the patient come back and then you check their uric acid level as well as their uh, liver and renal function. You wanna look at the liver and see if there are any problems. If the uric acid is still greater than six, you need to get put it up to 80. In Europe, the maximum solubility or the maximum dose is uh, 120 milligrams a day. In the United States, officially it's 80. There are times when you get an extra five to 10% if you have a patient who's say at 6.2, 6.3, beg and plead and, um, and um, grovel at the uh, insurance company's um, door and ask them, can we please put it up to 120 so we can get, get them to stop having gout attacks. Peglodicase, this is the newest medicine in our treatment for gout. This is for patients who have severe tophaceous gout. And I mean, as in the patients, you see them with the uric, you know, with the tophi just hanging off the elbow, hanging off the hands. This is actually pegylated uricase. Uh, what they've done is taken a polyethylene glycol chain and they've mounted the serum, uh, the uricase onto that chain. This is given IV every two weeks, and the goal is to do it for a six-month period. Um, one of the things sort of interesting is this is highly immunogenic. And so one of the biggest step, stumbling blocks to a lot of us who've used case was that patients would come in and have a hypersensitivity reaction while on the medicine. We've come up with a solution. What we are now doing is we're pre-treating these patients with weekly methotrexate or daily dose mycophenolate for four weeks prior to the first dose. Um, one of the things we do is we check the serum uric acid prior to each dose administration. I have done this with patients and I've watched their uric acid drop from 10 or 11 down to zero. I mean, literally zero. And it is that impressive. Um, the rapid dissolution of TOFI is nothing short of amazing. The patients come in and they're just overjoyed because these big lumps they've had on their hands or their elbows are gone. And it really does a great job. The one problem is you can tell when someone is at an increased risk of developing a hypersensitivity reaction where by if you do the uric acid and it's been zero and zero and zero, then one day, the day before you're supposed to give it, the uric acid has jumped back up to eight or nine. That's someone who is making antibodies, and that's someone who is a, at a high uric uh, rate for um, developing a hypersensitivity reaction. So if I see one and they're going along zero, one, zero, 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 and then it goes nine, I'm going to stop the medication at that point. Now, this is the uh, study that was done. I mentioned this a little bit ago. Um, this is what my treatment protocol is when I use case. I start the patients on 15 milligrams a week of methotrexate, and I do this once a week for four weeks before I start the peglodicase. What they found was that uh, almost 80% of patients who um, got this protocol were able to stay on the uh, peglodicase for six months compared to only 42%. I think that number on the, on the ones is a little bit on the high side. My experience is if someone isn't, is on it long enough, they're going to have a reaction in it. You know, Any kind of dose we can give is good, but... If we could go a lot, the longer we go, the more likely the uric acid uh, stores that are throughout the body will be dissolving away. In terms of prophylaxis, I think this is an important thing, and I think this is underutilized. We always talk about colchicine being a great medication for gout attacks. I think it also works very, very well as a prophylaxis in the patient that you're starting anti-hyperuricemia uh, um, medicines. 
So what I will do is I'll start a patient on uh, one colchicine a day or one, one twice a day as tolerated, and then I start my allopurinol therapy. What we find is that the patients don't have any further gout attacks. It keeps them from having gout attacks as you're starting the uric acid uh, lowering agents. We know that uh, any in rapid increase or rapid drop in the serum uric acid is what can trigger a gout attack. And so if we can find a way to keep the attack from occurring as we're lowering the uric acid, the better for the patient. I've had patients who we've started on allopurinol and colchicine at the same time, and their last gout attack was before we started the medicines. And after six months or a year, I will talk to them about stopping the colchicine. Many of them are scared stiff about stopping it because they know how well they've done, and they just don't want to have another gout attack. So what I do is I say, well, why don't we cut it in half, take a half a pill, then if they haven't been having any attacks, then we say, why don't we do this? Let's have you have it available. If you start to feel a twinge of an attack, you immediately take the colchicine and we'll get it under control. It's important to do the um, anti-inflammatory prophylaxis for at least three to six months, because the longer they are on the uh, urate lowering therapy, the less likely they are to have further gout attacks. And so that's what you're trying to prevent is that recurrent gout attack after you've started the treatment. This also comes into mind that a lot of patients will come in and they're started on allopurinol and they still have a gout attack and they'll say, it didn't work because I still had a gout attack. And it's part of the, it's the mentality that you have to understand. You got to keep that uric acid low long enough to get the gout attacks to no longer occur. And that's where the culture scene really comes in handy. Let's see. Oh, where is it? There it is. Let's see. Oop, there they go. There. Uric acid levels, what are we aiming at? Again, I'm a strong believer that gout needs to be a treat-to-target uh, modality. Uh, we want to monitor uric acid levels when you start the urate-lowering therapy. Your goal is to get the uric acid at the very least below 6. The lower you get it, the better. I really try and push more to get it to under 5. If a patient has a history of kidney stones, or if they have TOFI that you find on, on your, when you do your physical exam, those are the ones you want to get the serum uric acid level below five. It's important to periodically evaluate the serum urate level to make sure that the target level is being maintained. I've had patients who have been on 200 milligrams a day of, of uh, allopurinol, and uh, after a year, they've, we start to see it creeping up again, so we start uh, increasing the dose. The only way to treat this is to really monitor the serum urate levels. And the best time to measure a serum uric acid is not during an attack. You wait into the intercritical period because about half the time the uric acid may be normal in someone with a gout attack. Preventing further flares. Again, this is why we use the uh, colchicine NSAIDs. The problem with NSAIDs is many of those patients have other comorbidities, and so that makes them not the best choice. You don't want to have somebody on low-dose corticosteroids for long periods of time. That's the, because they've got a ton of side effects of their own. The biggest thing is anytime you have a urate-lowering therapy, that can trigger an attack to what we call a mobilization flare. And so that's why we use medicines to help prevent the gout attacks. Now, everybody wants to do lifestyle. We love to have patients come in and say, what can I do to stop this gout attack? I think everybody wants to help uh, stop their, uric, uh, their gout attacks. And so we talk about lifestyle and medication changes. First one is limit alcohol intake, particularly beer. Not sure why, but beer has a bigger effect on the uh, serum uric acid levels and on gout attacks. Wine has some, it's modest compared to beer. High purine food intake. This is such as organ meats, such as uh, shellfish, such as um, you know, a lot of fatty meats. These are things that have high purine levels and those can help to uh, cause it. I've had patients who admit that when they went out to went to the beach and had uh, a ton of shrimp, they had the worst gout attack they've ever had. Reducing high fructose corn syrup containing products. Most of the soft drinks sold in the United States today, uh, when they have, sh when they are uh, sweetened with, uh, that without artificial sweeteners, contain high fructose corn syrup. Many syrups you know, that you get for your pancakes are high fructose corn syrup. All of these are things that can help to trigger a gout attack. 
weight loss makes a big uh, event. And so this is something, or weight loss also can help with gout attacks and hyperuricemia. When we talk about patients, we want them to lose weight. We don't want to go too fast because too rapid of a weight loss can help to trigger a gout attack because of the mobilization uh, hyperuricemia. Looking at medications, there are certain medications that uh, for blood pressure that can have a positive or a negative effect on uh, gout, on the hyperuricemia. HCTZ and the other thiazide diuretics are well recognized as causing an elevation of the serum uric acid. Low-dose aspirin, if you have a gout attack patient, you've got to balance the uh, risk of the heart disease with the use of the low-dose aspirin on a gout patient. Finally, a couple of things that are sort of interesting. Number one, losartan, uh, which is an ARB, actually has been shown to reduce hyperuric uh, the hyperuricemia, uh, and that's something to keep in mind. So, if you have a patient that you're trying to who has gout, you're trying to decide what medication to use. Losartan would be an excellent choice. One other thing that I will put in here is that I did not add on there is uh, one beverage that people have been shown to have a reduction in their uh, uric acid level is skim milk. We don't know exactly what is in the skim milk, but we know that uh, someone who is a regular drinker of, or user of skim milk is going to have a little bit lowering of their serum uric acid level. And so basically, these are some of the things we talk about again. Um, strict dietary control may reduce it, but it's only one to two milligrams. I think if you can get the uric acid level controlled with medications, the uh, lifestyle changes can help, and that may be a beneficial thing. It makes the patient feel a little more um, participatory in their health care. It's not something that's going to solve the problem. So if somebody goes with the strictest um, Vegan diet, they're only going to lower it at the most, maybe one to two milligrams. So if you have a uric acid of 11 or 12, going vegan may lower it uh, one to two milligrams. That's still not good enough. And again, what we try to shoot for is the target of uh, less than six, preferably less than five. So basically, one of the things that's important to realize, gout's a disease that's chronic. It's not just an every now and then attack. There is inflammation in the joints between attacks, and that unfortunately is something that can actually result in damage and destruction to the joints. Um, treatment of the uric acid level, we don't give it unless they've had gout attacks or unless it's exceedingly high. Someone who comes in with a uric acid level of 8.1, 8.5 is not someone that we need to be using allopurinol on unless they've had a gout attack. Management of gout attack, what we want to try and do is we want to get the hyperuricemia under control. You need to take a look at it as a treat-to-target approach. Again, getting the patient's uric acid levels down, preferably below five. With that, I will conclude. Um, if you ever need to have questions about this and want to get in touch with me, uh, the folks at the Southern Medical Association have uh, great amounts of information on how to reach me. Additionally, if you go to the SMA website, you will also discover we've got lots of information on our annual assemblies and other educational programs. So this is a great resource, and I urge you all to take a look at sma.org. With that, I am.